Thanks for coming, everyone. I want to introduce Pamela Cudd to you. She uh, looks a little different these days. But no, we're excited uh, to have Ryan Croft here with us. Pamela had COVID last week, and she's on the tail end of that, getting over it. So uh, Ryan has come to talk with us. He's going to share about his faith and his background and how he has come to be working at the City of Refuge. And so we're excited to have Brian. So let's welcome him as he comes up to speak. Thank you, Pastor. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Croft. And as he said, you had a very talented speaker who was going to be here tonight. That didn't happen. Um, my name is Brian Croft, and I work at City of Refuge here in Dalton, uh, which is um, a, a facility that's able to help the less fortunate in our community with a lot of different services. And I brought a, a brochure that actually gives a, a visual and a description. I can give some of these out. I probably should have went around and put some of these on the tables already. Um, if you'd like yeah, to grab it. one of those, and I'm going to steal one too because I might have to reference it myself. So I called yesterday to inform him that Pam wasn't coming, and he said that, I said, so what do you want me to say, or how long do I need to speak? And I said, five, ten minutes. He laughed at me. Um, so then, then he said, well, I want you to kind of share about your faith, and then also how that works into what you're doing. So that took me to a whole other mindset there, uh, just talking about my faith, because when I talk about my faith, I think I always have to go back to the, somewhat of the beginning and connect dots uh, for, for folks. I'm, I'm a transplant from uh, Ohio. Just get that up. Yep. Shut it down. Let's go to the house. No, I'm just joking. I'm a, I'm a hybrid Yankee, I guess you could say it. I, I've been down here since 1990. Um, so I've been here a long time. I can go home and visit some folks in Ohio and they say I sound like a Southerner. Some folks down here say, no, you still sound like a Yankee. I don't fit in anywhere now. Um, but this is home. I fell in love with the area, the community, the, the scenery, the people. Um, this is my home and I've made it my home and I've been here since 1990. So uh, I'm here to stay, unless y'all run me out of town, which I hope you don't. But uh, when, I, when I think of my faith, I, I've got to go back to, 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 to the young Brian Croft and the, uh, the uh, boy that grew up in Ohio. My, my story isn't like a lot of folks that might have grown up, and we were sitting there talking before this and uh, having the opportunity to grow up in a church and a church family and a church environment and all the benefits of that. That wasn't my story, uh, unfortunately. I, I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. Um, everybody was uh, on welfare or food stamps. My mother and father, they divorced when I was about three years old. So my mom was doing the best she can to provide for me and my sister. And uh, we were just young and, and, and headstrong and stubborn. And uh, we didn't, it, it didn't, I didn't realize um, maybe how unfortunate we were or how our upbringing was until we went and visited family and then saw that other people had more stuff than we did and different things. So I was always at a young age, I was always keeping score in the back of my head, like they have and I don't have, or they, they have a parent or a dad and I, I don't have a dad. And so that it just always felt a struggle and a tug of war. But I also didn't cross a lot of lines that some of my same friends did. I felt like God was always with me um, even though I didn't understand it back then or know what it was, but I felt like God was always with me. He was always protecting me, keeping me out of situations, trying to make a better choice and a better uh, uh, decision in some certain uh, situations. But my, my, make a long story short, my father, um, who I really wanted to get to know, he moved away from Ohio at the time. I only had a handful of memories of my dad my entire life. And uh, that, that uh, was a big void growing up as a teenage kid. No father, no, no real instruction, making a lot of bad choices of my own. I wanted to move in with him at a certain age. Someone said, when you get to be 14 or 15, you get to pick which parent you move in with. And I was like, I put that away. I'm like, man, when I get to that age, I'm going to find out who dad is so I can find out what it is to be a man or what it is to be a croft. Um, and so that was my plan. But unfortunately, my father, he died about eight days from my 15th birthday. Um, they, my family come to visit us and they told us and said, your, your father had passed away. And as a young boy, I was mad. I was rebellious. I was stubborn. I mean, I made poor decision after poor decision. Um, long story short, um, I went through high school and, and made a lot of bad choices there. Um, I signed up for the military in my senior year. Uh, went to the MEP Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Raise your right hand. Mr. Crawford, you're in the United States military. You can't get out if you wanted to. And unfortunately, they threw me a big curveball because uh, in July, when I was supposed to leave, I actually called the recruiter. I, I, I sold my car. I quit my job. I had a going away party. 
and they they said uh, uh, unfortunately they just passed something and, and all of a sudden you're not able to go and I said what I don't know who that guy was but he would have been very mad at me if he had got a hold of me because I wasn't able to they weren't able to keep my contract or whatever I can't remember the full scenario I just made bad choices after that and and I moved in with my grandmother um, and I thank God for grandmas. Uh, my grandma, uh, she said, if you're going to move with us, you're going to go church. And I said, no problem. I just wanted to get out of the environment that I was living in, uh, making bad choices. And so moved into grandma's house. And there's something magical about grandma's house. Um, just, man, just being there. Felt safe, felt good. Everything was calm and order. And uh, lived with her for about a year. And then we, my cousin called me and asked me if I wanted to move to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, in that year, I was living with grandma going to church. I was going to her church, and I believe I got saved in her church, but back then, I don't think there was as much interaction or not too many people come alongside and really describe the relationship part. I thought I had got me an insurance policy. I had a real encounter. I was in church. I asked God to come in my heart and my life, and it felt real, but I just kind of felt like I just put that insurance policy right there, and I'll need that one day. Um, fast forward again. When my cousin called me at my grandmother's house, here I am, 19, 20 years old. He said, hey, I'm moving to Chattanooga, Tennessee. You want to go? And, uh, man, I, it didn't take too much to think about it. And I just, uh, young and rambunctious, we moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, the, I made a lot of bad choices in my younger years. We were here for about three months, and me and my cousin were in a car accident together. And, unfortunately, um, he, he did not live. Um, he, he died about one week later after being here for three months in Chattanooga, no. Tennessee. And so when I say I made bad choices, I'm giving you these dramatic scenarios of my father passing away and my cousin passing away because those were the scenarios that I was using to have a pity party for this guy and to continue to make bad choices throughout my life. Um, I ended up in Dalton, Georgia about 1995. Um, Dalton, Georgia, a friend of mine was living in this area. They said, hey, come live with us. Try to get your feet underneath you. Let's try to get some doing some good things and moving forward. There's work here. And so I moved to Dalton, Georgia, and uh, long story short, I was still making bad choices, wasn't living right, wasn't doing right. Um, I was working for a gentleman here in town. You guys might have heard of him. His name is Jack and Pat Flamini. Anybody know Jack and Pat Flamini? Amen. Um, the, uh, I was working for them about 1995, 96, and I wasn't living right, and, and it was visible to anybody who was around me. And uh, they, they said, uh, uh, Jack came to me, said, hey, Brian, he said, you ever thought about going down to Providence? And I was like, what's Providence? And he said, well, they got a program down there, and uh, they have a shelter, and they got all this stuff. And he said, that program might benefit you. So he knew what I was doing. I was not living right. I was making bad choices. And uh, I rejected it at first. Uh, we did go down, and I saw the place. And when I heard homeless shelter, I was thinking, man, there's going to be cobwebs in the corner and people walking around like this. And I've never had the best of everything, but I've never really been without. So the concept of going to that kind of facility just didn't, it wasn't my first choice. And uh, so I, I dug my hole a little deeper, and then I went back to Jack, and I said, hey, you st maybe I think I, I should go down to Providence maybe and check out what's going on down there. And I was 29 years old at that point. And uh Went through the program uh, of Providence Ministries in 1999. I went through their substance abuse program for the very first time in my life at the age of 29 years old. And uh, best thing ever happened to me. Uh, there was two grown men that were working there. One was named Chaplain Bob and the other name was Billy Blea. And these were two adult men, Christian men, that were sowing into people's lives, telling you, hey, Brian, there's a different way of life. Hey, Brian, you don't have to be this way. Hey, Brian, God loves you. Man, he does. I don't have to be. I can. We, we, life can get better. And it was getting better. I ended up going back to school and went on to Dalton State College, uh, doing things, living right. God, man, God was really speaking to me. I'd open up my, my Bible, and I'd, uh, the one of the times that he spoke to me the most, it was never loud and thunderous, but you know how God, he does whisper to our heart and speak to us through his word. I truly believe that wholeheartedly. But I was reading my Bible one night there at Providence, and I was asking God just to connect with me and show me something. And uh, he said, uh, just whispered it to my heart. He just said, you didn't listen to your mother when you were young. Are you going to listen to me now? It made sense. Because as I just said a minute ago, man, I thought mom was a mean, cruel, evil woman. She just is a party pooper. She's telling me where to go and, and where, what not to do and how to act and what not to act and who to hang out with and who not to hang out with. And she just doesn't know. I'm having fun. It was never really fun. It ended up being misery. And so here I was at, at, at the age of 29 and God saying, 
Brian, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got some plans for you, where to go, where not to go, how to act, how not to act, what to do, what not to do, and are you going to follow, follow along that uh, path? And best thing ever happened to me in my life, and I uh, reconnected my relationship with Jesus Christ. I was, uh, like I said, back in uh, going to college, doing different things. Um, I'll try to make this fast, as, this part anyway. So the, I was there for a period of time, I want to say two, almost two and a half years, somewhere in that ballpark. And unfortunately, um, at the time that I was there, both of these two men, the mentors, coaches, they both passed away in about an eight-month period of time. And uh, man, that really messed with me because death had been something I'd struggled with. I hadn't really, haven't figured out how to compartmentalize that area or how to process death and how to, how to feel lonely again on this planet. Our islands get a little smaller, especially as we get older. And my island was getting smaller, and I was like, I'm not this old. And, and everybody around me just keeps to disappear and, and doesn't stay. And so that was, that's my own stuff that I had to process and work on. Um, so long story short, both of them men passed away. I left Providence for a period of time. Um, I came back to Providence uh, October the 5th in 2004. And uh, as a result of, again, just making bad choices, I, I had to have another little pity party, whatever you want to call it. Um, I called Providence and, and spoke to Brother Roy, and he said, come, on, come down and, and we'll talk. And uh, I know I'm talking about Providence a little, uh, but I, I asked Pam ahead of time. I said, I'm going to tell my whole story, right? And she goes, Brian, I, we're, tell your story. So anyway, we um, went down to talk to Brother Roy, and he ended up saying, hey, come back through the program again. My, my pride almost got in the way in 2004. My, and the Bible's very clear about pride. Pride cometh before a fall. And I would have really fell much deeper, much darker, much uglier had I let my pride take charge that day. Uh, but he knew what was better for me. And, and anyway, long story short, I went back to the program, started at, at ground zero, uh, went through the program, uh, went into transitional living, uh, ended up coming on staff, uh, went to, uh, um, I got my certification as an addiction counselor and practiced that for about 10 plus years at Providence Ministries. Um, helping others, encouraging others, motivating each other, sharing Christ with others. And uh, man, it just uh, was a really neat journey and I really enjoy my time at Providence and I really enjoy what God allowed us to do. Um, fast forward just a little bit, I got married while I was at Providence and uh, uh, unfortunately um, my wife had uh, taken her own life and uh, I kind of shut down again. I didn't I didn't go out. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't backtrack. I was in a good environment. I had a stronger relationship with Christ, and I was around good people, and uh, uh, it really could have set me back. I gave up the counseling at that point uh, because I just felt like I was ineffective. I wanted to try something different. I didn't want to be responsible for other people's lives, and when you lose a spouse like that, it, it just... It, and some of you probably know exactly how I feel, but it was devastating, and uh, so I wanted to change my life a little bit, wanted to do something different. At the time, I was working part-time for Julie and People's Funeral Home, of all places. Um, I was already working there part-time, and Dan had asked me to come on board full-time, and so I stepped away from Providence and went to work for Dan at Julie and People's Funeral Home um, with Julie and, and Jane and a uh, wonderful family. was doing that for a season, and um, the call that God still had on my heart in my life, I really felt like I was supposed to be doing something different than a funeral home. I ended up going back to Providence as their PR and uh, development, um, I'm sorry, director of PR and development for Providence Ministries. And this was just before COVID came, about a year or so before that. And um, I was working, uh, felt like things were going good. COVID happened. Everything got shut down, got laid off from Providence from there's no PR development happening at the beginning of COVID. And going back to work full time with Julian Peoples uh, here in, in, on Cleveland Highway and Rocky Face. And, but I still felt like God was just, uh, just touching my heart and saying, Brian, I want, you, I want you to come out of the graveyard. I want you helping those that are still there. I didn't know when it was going to happen. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, I just kept being faithful to Julian Peoples. That is a ministry in itself, 100% a ministry. Uh, I remember speaking at a funeral one time, and I didn't know what to say. I asked a pastor, I said, what do I say at a funeral? He said, his response was, Brian, he said, you honor the dead and you comfort the living. And uh, so that, the whole time I was at Julian Peoples, I looked at it that same way as a, as a ministry. Um, I came to work for City of Refuge just this year in June. Uh, they had approached me and said that, they, uh, that the gentleman that was the director of operations was stepping down, and uh, they asked me if I wanted to come on board. 
And it was a no-brainer for me because I really felt like God was really pushing me to get back involved in community, get back in service, get back in helping folks. And if you've not been to City of Refuge lately, and me and the pastor were talking prior to this, um, some of you have been down there when they were in the house on Bryant Street and serving meals. Then they moved into this monstrosity of a building on the corner of Morris and Glenwood. And that's the part that attracted me when I went in and talked to Pam and saw the somewhat of a blank canvas of things still to come and services that still can be implemented and programs uh, that can be developed, which are in the, in the works as well. The, the brochure that you have on your, on your desk, uh, on your table, uh, gives you somewhat of an insight on the numbers and the population that they're serving, the services that are provided currently. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are serving women and children. Um, there's a ladies support group that's meeting down there right now. Some of these ladies have been in abusive situations, maybe a trafficking situation. Maybe they're here and they're just stuck in America. A lot of the ladies that are in the program, or in the, I'm sorry, in the women's support group are actually um, uh, the Latino or Hispanic background. So they have another barrier there, the communication. Our, our lady who is uh, the women's outreach director, she has a Latino background, so she's bilingual. And so she's actually been able to build some serious relationships with these ladies, finding out what their true needs are, finding out where, where the uh, individuals need either food or uh, medical attention, maybe some uh, legal counsel and different things. So these ladies have uh, become to trust her. And just in the short time that I've been there, about four months now, the program, I've seen it grow. There was about eight to 10 women that were meeting there. Then it was 10 to 15. Now it's 15 to 20. And we uh, implemented an English class. And that really drew out a lot more people because some folks, want, hey, they want to learn. They want to be able to provide for their families. They want to be able to take their education to the next level, open up new doors. So the English class has really taken off. So um, if any of y'all have a, a desire to help and serve in that capacity, if you're a good teacher or a tutor or being able to help folks, you're help, willing to come down and or just share with the ladies at any time too, uh, motivate them or share your story. Uh, it's about connecting with people a lot of times. I, I shared a lot of, you, with, of me just now with you, and I really do that just to be transparent, um, to, to let you know where I've come from and the things that I've experienced in life. Somebody can say, well, Brian, oh, you've had a hard, sad life, and, and that may be true, but I think God took every one of those experiences and made a strong part in my life to be able to connect with people, to be able to relate with people, to have empathy, to be able to share with people and let them know you can come out on the other side of this storm. Um, and so, I, I, again, I, I didn't share all those storms to, to get anybody to just say, oh, poor Brian. I think God allowed those experiences to grow me and mature me. Um, I had a saying that I used to say to the guys all the time down there at Providence. I'd say, our maturity is the sum of our experiences. And so when we experience so much in life, sometimes we get a little bit more mature than we, than we want to. And so I had to mature fast, I guess, through my life at some point. But um, the uh, City of Refuge, you guys are familiar with. How many of y'all volunteered down there already? Just curious. Several of y'all. How many of y'all been to the new building? All of you? Or most of you, the same ones. And so and if there's a program that you would even like to talk about or discuss, and I know the pastor's saying that you're maybe looking at ways to be a part of the community or get involved, we'd, we'd even entertain bringing back a feeding program. We're currently, co you know, everybody changed the way they do services. Um, one of the neat programs that we really have right now uh, that, that actually transpired as a result of having to alter the way we do things from COVID is our senior feeding program. Um, a lot of the seniors were not getting out, were not going into public spaces. We were able to go into some of these senior communities. The, um, I guess it's like government subsidized senior housing and these apartments that are in, in town. There's about three or four different areas. And we actually take food to the seniors and uh, it's opened up uh, channels of communication. Uh, they tell us about needs that they might have. Um, they really look forward to us coming through there and bringing the food. We don't just drop the food off. And if they want to have a conversation, if it's a moment of prayer, some kind of interaction. Me personally, I told you that I love grandma. 
that's a program that I really would like to find, and I'm open to suggestions or conversations, uh, find new ways that we can increase this senior program or even get more committed folks to being part of it on a more routine basis. Uh, I think the senior population is, is unfortunately very ignored these days. I don't know about you guys, I have a family of six. I feel ignored in my own house some days just from the computers and everybody on their phones or, hey, can I get your attention for just a minute? Does anybody hear me? Um, so I, I hate to think of the loneliness that some of the seniors are feeling these days, being cooped up in their apartment or not even coming out or not even having a visitor or a family member stopping by. And so there's a large population of that in our area as well. Uh, so our senior feeding program, we take food to their uh, home directly. Uh, we have a lot of women and children who are already registered with us who do not have transportation. Uh, as we said, a lot of these are Hispanic people, and so some of them might be here and don't have a driver's license, so it's illegal for them to even drive, so they can't get around. Uh, but they've been able to get a family member or friend to bring them to us. They've been documented through our program, and we actually can take food to their house and, and, and give it to them and their children as well. So we have a food delivery program. Um, our pantry which is, is open to the public, can, is open on Wednesdays and Fridays from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Anybody in Dalton can come and receive a meal. Uh, being able to um, uh, just show up, the two qualifiers, if you do suggest it to somebody you know that needs food, the only two qualifiers are they have to have a uh, physical uh, a Georgia identification of some kind and proof of Whitfield residency. Those are the two qualifiers. There's no money exchange or anything like that. There's no cost for anything. When you give away the food that's accumulated through the uh, Chattanooga Food Bank and, and government subsidies, they're really particular that the food is distributed in the county that it's given. So that's why we have those two requirements. They do have to have an ID and a Whitfield County uh, proof of residency. So if you do refer somebody, that's the only two uh, requirements. Um, the um, Women and Children's program has been, has, has been growing. We're still trying to find more ways to sow into these ladies' lives, help them uh, uh, become better providers, help them be able to improve their uh, finances or their income. The English class is a start of that, and then we do have a lot of volunteers that come in. They may do a trauma class with them. They may do a Bible study with them. They may just uh, do arts and crafts and have fun time. While that's happening with the ladies, so they're having their adult time, we actually have child care that's taking place in the, in the nursery as well. So even if you didn't feel comfortable coming and sharing with the ladies, if any of y'all would ever consider coming down on uh, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday mornings, you can actually go into the nursery and help take care of the children while the mothers are in there having their class as well. So that's a volunteer opportunity. Um, trying to think of, uh, we were uh, talking about the building itself. Uh, the, the, the building itself is a work in progress. The, it was a gift. And then it was also a huge <laughs> undertaking. Um, I've, I've, I've complimented Pam on her, uh, her ministry overall because I had seen her from a distance. We worked together on a couple different projects. Um, I, she didn't just pick me out of a barrel. Uh, we worked on a couple projects when I worked at Providence Ministries. We worked with the Homeless Coalition with Mayor Pennington and whenever they di uh, did the Tent City and they were trying to put shelter plus uh, housing in place for everybody that qualified. So we took every homeless population that we could find and we gave them a physical evaluation, a mental health evaluation, and if they qualified, they were able to get the shelter plus housing. So some of those programs are still in place and some of those residents are still in place and Pam does their case management with them as well. Um, so the, um, I lost my train of thought for just a split second. The um, the building itself is just a huge undertaking, and we're, we're looking at currently our program that we would like to implement is a workforce development innovation hub. That's a big mouthful, uh, but workforce development, here we are talking about the, the less fortunate in our community. Um, how do we become less fortunate? Well, most of us know that you do that through education, and when you get your education, it raises your ability to, to, to uh, um, your income, which allows you to provide for your family on another level. So that's the next uh, step that Pam has in, in vision right now. There's already been a portion of the building that was starting to be renovated uh, on, this, on the third floor and COVID happened, what they, that terrible word, everybody just keeps using it. I, I'm using it a lot right now, but COVID happened and the story is COVID happened and the brakes got put on that. 
And so the electricals almost run completely. The plumbing was being run for the bathrooms. The sheetrock was going up on the walls. And they were, they were going to, classrooms down through there. And, and the workforce development program was going to start. So we've been tr going, uh, we've had uh, meetings with uh, Dalton State uh, College and uh, some of the folks there, Margaret Venable and, and uh, two more of her um, uh, leaders in different departments. We've met with Shaw and uh, some of the folks that do their workforce development as well, just trying to figure out what program we can put together that would fit the population that we serve in the best way that we can help them, again, uh, increase their learning and increase their skills. Some of them might just be one or two classes away from getting a, another skill set or, or, or getting uh, uh, the promotion that they may want or be able to, uh, some of them have to have one or two more classes so they can even just walk into a college and fill out an application even. So uh, meeting people where they're at is one of the neat things about um, what I've seen with Pam and, and City of Refuge now is that, and she says this all the time, just love them where they're at. And so it's good to love people where they're at, but you also want to be able to help them get to where they need to be and want to be. And so um, I, I started off a minute ago talking about the building, um, and I, my train of thought just came back. I'm showing my age here a little bit. Oh, all right, never mind. The, uh, um, did anybody guess my age yet? No? I said 29, I went to the problem, so I'm 52 years old. Um, and so I, I, anyway... That's neither here nor there. I just use the age thing at my house. It works better. It didn't work on you guys. Your guys look at me like, no, you're a young buck still. <laughs> didn't, didn't even move. Um, every time they ask me to do something physical, I was, no, I'm getting older. No, I'm just. Um, I told Pam I was impressed with her ministry and how it grew, and I was really impressed with where it's at now. But then looking at that building and going through that building, I said I was really impressed that you stayed. And she's got a vision, and she's got a, a plan, and I think with this community, and, and the reason why I told you my whole story and also connected it with Providence is that this is a loving community. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. If you ever gave to Providence Ministries, you gave to my life. If you, ever, if you donated one piece of clothing, you, do, you, do, you donated to my life. So I know change can happen. I know that Dalton cares and loves for people. And there's so much need in this community. Um, it, it just every day, the, the other day for the first time uh, was a Ukrainian family showed up at Providence, or showed up at the City of Refuge with their passports in hand, two adults and two children, Ukrainian passports, couldn't speak English. And they had a, a family member was with them and, and, knew, and knew some English and brought them down there. And we started a whole conversation. I don't, man, I walked away from there and I, I started crying. I was like, man, I could not imagine having to uplift my whole family, go to an other side of the world and try to put something together that looked anything calm and stable. And man, that's just devastating. And that's also even in our own communities. When, pe when relationships break up, when somebody gets mad and divorces the next one or kicks one out, so a lot of these ladies that are in our women's support group right now, they're, they're stuck, a lot of them. They might have been brought here in a relationship or a marriage, and then all of a sudden that went south, and now, now they're here. Like I said, they may have been abused or been trafficked, and they've been dropped off right here in Dalton, Georgia. It's, 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 and I'm not trying to boogity-woogie or tell you anything you don't know, but there is a lot of need in Dalton. And so we try to do our part every day that we can. And the, um, the opportunities at City of Refuge, we, we don't currently have any housing for women and children as far as a shelter. That building was not zoned for that. Um, I guess it meant a lot of kickback from the powers that be uh, that said hey, you can do services, you can have groups, you can have counseling, you can help people, but you're not going to be able to house anybody right now. So until that ever changes, we'll just keep meeting people and plugging them into the best resources we can, help them where we can, and, and provide the best services and education and food and, and clothing and whatever other services that we can to help the individuals. But they um, still have that on their post-wish list or uh, which the housing. The, the, well, on here? What? In the building, oh. because I've been down there and I remember they talked about. Oh yeah, on the wish list, yes ma'am. No, you're right. And so it, until that changes, that, that would be on the wish list. I'm sorry. You're 100% correct. Yes ma'am. Put it on our prayer list, right? 
Um, there, it's a 200,000 square foot building. There's three stories in there. And only about 25 to 30 percent of the building has been renovated now. Um, we have, uh, since I've been there, uh, in the time I've been there, we've already been able to secure two more portions of the roof. Um, just giving you a small update there, but that's been the biggest undertaking financially is securing the roof. The building was, you guys might have better knowledge of this than me, but supposedly 1920s or 30s, it was cabin craft initially, and then it was West Point Pepperell for decades, and, and then it was Shaw Industries for decades, but the roof and the building went very neglected. And so being able to move further into the building, you have to secure the roof before you can uh, do the demolition and reconstruction on the inside. So. Uh, we did secure two more large portions of the roof, and so we can start working on more projects. Any of you guys that have a men's group that want to come down and, and tackle something, boy, I, I'd love to have you down there. We'll, we'll plan as many people to meet down there as we can. Um, but the uh, that's, that's, that's such a huge undertaking, but we can only I tell everybody who comes and volunteers on a regular basis. I remind them, I say, I, I was told a long time ago there's only one way to eat an elephant. That's one bite at a time. And so every day we're taking a little bite and a little bite. And so if, even if you can come down and just sweep a floor for a couple of hours or, or scrape a wall or do something like that, that's, that's one more bite out of this elephant. And uh, so there's all kinds of opportunities to serve right here, be part of what's happening down there. And more so, as you said, the wish list and, and keep us in your, on your prayer list um, that God would just open up more doors, show us how we can serve our community better. Um, that's that's really what attracted me, and I said this a little bit ago, I think, but that's really what attracted me to City of Refuge when she approached me, is the, the potential for the services that are down there and what's already in place. It's being done, and it's being done well, and so just more room to grow and doing different things. And so I'm really excited about that and glad to be a part of it. But had God not touched and changed this guy's life and heart back in 1999, I want to be standing in front of you right now. And so one of the things I like to do when given the opportunity is to share my story with some folks and to encourage some of the guys that come through the doors or motivate them in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, it's easy to say I understand or I sympathize or I've been, I can really look at some of these guys and say, I've been where you've been. No, you ain't been. Most people, when I start telling them my story or my background, no, there ain't no way. There ain't no way. But uh, some of y'all knew me even back then, and he asked how we knew. She probably knew me before God got a hold of my heart because uh, I've not always been a Christian. I wish I had the story that I grew up in church. Maybe it would have been different and grand the entire time, but it's been grand ever since. God got a hold of my heart, and life is good today. It really is, and I just want to serve God. I want to serve our community, and I want to help others, and uh, we can't do it by ourselves. We can't. We need churches like your church right here. Uh, we need folks in our community that can come alongside of us, partner with us with their time, talents, treasure, and their prayers. Um, any way that you're able to do so, we are greatly appreciative of. Um, before I ramble more and just tell another age, unnecessary fact, um, I'm going to be quiet. Does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, do you have a relationship with Providence? Are you related at all? Uh, currently, we, we, so a lot of this, I say a lot. I know of two staff that go and participate in some of their programs still. Um, do, are you, do you guys know Mary Lil, by chance, Mary Lil Calfee? She, 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 she uh, uh, heads up the administrative side of City of Refuge, but she goes out to the ladies' facility and, and encourages the lady in their ladies' program. Uh, so I think she does that once a week. Um, I'm on the rotation at Providence to go down either on Tuesday mornings or Friday mornings, and I'll do a devotion uh, with the guys in the program and encourage them and motivate them on a Tuesday or Friday morning. So I get to do that still. They, they, yeah, no, they, they, uh, and I'm sorry that I tied them together in the conversation so much, but yeah, but I've worked in nonprofit at Providence, and now I'm working in nonprofit at City of Refuge. So yeah, I didn't want to confuse you there. I'm sorry. Roy's a great guy, though. Y'all know Roy Johnson as well. I heard Tony was here recently. Um, he's a much more uh, he's a much more talented speaker than myself. Great guy, Tony Howitt. Uh, but I I personally believe that there you, you there's there's so much to be done. There shouldn't be proprietary. There shouldn't be divisions. Like you said, are we connected? We're not connected, but we are because we're serving our community. And so really, I, I don't think at that point it should be this team or that team. It should be we're all in, in human services and we're all helping. So we do collaborate on some things, I'm sure. And I know for a fact, like if we get an abundance of a certain donation, 
we, and we know we're not going to use all that. We will call uh, Providence Ministries or vice versa. They might call us and say, hey, we have an abundance of this. Can you guys use some of this too? So we do collaborate, but we're not, they're not connected. No, ma'am. Have you heard of uh, Grace Medical Outreach? Um, is it that the doctor um, that does house calls? Um, yeah. Yes, uh, through Grace Presbyterian. Was he not initially, or was that one of his home churches? That's where they're, uh, they're located, over there housed or it's kind of um their launching point yes but their inner church but he's coming next wednesday yes and the reason i mention is because he you mentioned about serving seniors and yes and their outreach is to seniors who can't get out to go do their medical right. need you know to visit doctors and so that's their kind of heart so i was just thinking if you're interested in partnering or connecting with them yes. then you know there might be a partnership that's there because that is their main focus is yes. reaching out to seniors and I've, I've just started going back to the community collaborative meetings that meet at the mike gatson center and he was there this past month so now that you said it that way describing this program i will approach him next well, time tell say, us about that collaborative what is that the it is it's all nonprofits in in whitfield in in dalton area um that, not everybody attends it consistently, but it, they all have the potential to. Um, the women, the uh, Lori McDaniel from the Family Crisis Center, I believe she's the one that spearheads the meetings right now. And so they'll send out an email. We, they set out the date and everyone comes down. And then you do get to stand up and, and you do almost a little commercial for your own facility. And then they also have a, a guest speaker that day that's talking about maybe a new program or new opportunity or some grants or different things that are in our community. Uh, but that meets monthly. Um, of course, they're not, they're not meeting this month with uh, uh, December being uh, Christmas month. Right. So I think it's canceled this month. So they'll meet back again starting in January. But it's really a, a neat meeting for folks to be able to get together and collaborate and work together, just like we were describing with Providence. Absolutely. Um, I just want to say, I, for some reason, I felt compelled to share this because he brought up grace as well. But this is a real pivotal point of my own story. And so how powerful our words are and how powerful our interactions are with people. Um, when, when, I was, when I was at Providence um, and I came through the program and, and I'm doing good and then I went on staff and I'm working. One afternoon, Brother Roy came to me and said, he said, hey, um, I'm not going to be in town. Grace Presbyterians having their local missions conference. Can you go down there and represent uh, Providence Ministries? And I'm thinking, I don't really, I don't talk to folks. I don't know how to do that kind of thing. But he asked me, so I said yes. And so I showed up at Grace Presbyterian with our little display thing. And, and I put our little display up there and I put our little brochures out there. And then they had a meal just sort of like this setting right here. And uh, before the actual conference, and so I get my food, and I'm looking around, okay, don't sit there, no, 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 no. I just found me a blank little table, and I just sat down, and all of a sudden, people started filling in around me, and uh, this gentleman that was across from me started a conversation, and he said, well, how, how'd you end up at Providence? And I said, and I was like, oh, gosh, here we go. So I, I, do, I, do, my, do, I, do I expose myself as a recovering addict? Do I tell him anything? And so I, I kind of found a creative way to say it. I just said, I looked at him, I said, well, truth be known, I said, I'm the fruits of their ministry. And, and, and uh, I said, I came through, and that I did say it. I said, I came through their program. And I'm thinking, okay, here's the moment. He's just going to turn around and, okay, how are y'all doing? Everybody good over here? And then, I, I didn't know what to expect because I'm, I'm nervous. I didn't, nobody likes rejection, right? But that man, he changed my life that day. Because he looked at me and he said, so you've experienced God's grace also. What did he just say? What did he just say? Man, so all this separation that I was feeling about myself and my history and my past and my ugliness and, and, and my dirty laundry, you guys are way up here and I'm way down here in my head. But on that day when that guy said that, brought it down to here and it felt good and I was like thank you Lord thank you Lord our words are powerful and so anytime we get a chance to impact somebody encourage somebody motivate them and I, I'm telling you we get to do it every day down there and that's why I enjoy getting up and going to work it's not work we get to serve amen I'll be quiet I said that once already didn't I what's the um Big, what's some of the biggest challenges that you face and how can we pray for you? 
Um, I pray, pray for, just like every nonprofit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> she said it. Did y'all hear? Yeah. She said, money. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. You know, huh? And, and it, it, it's sad but true. I mean, it, manpower is huge because we can really accomplish a lot in that building the way that it's setting right now. Uh, money is the next thing or just lead us to the grant or lead us to some kind of funding or um, put it on somebody's heart. I, I know we have a generous community. And so uh, our staff, we, we do run somewhat of a skeleton staff right now, but it, we don't have all these extra programs going. So just pray for, for God to, to grow as he sees fit in the pace that he sees fit. Um, I get anxious. I want an, a fast forward button. I want an easy button. I want things to start happening in life. But we do, um, that's uh, one thing that is new, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I just remembered this. One of Pam's visions for City of Refuge, and especially in that large building, is to collaborate with as many nonprofits as we can that are service oriented with people, which is kind of unheard of. Everybody's a little proprietary when it comes to that, but we would like to break that mold a little bit. And it has happened with our first other nonprofit that's actually on our property. Uh, they are renting their office space, which they would have rented it anywhere, but they're also partners with us. Uh, it's called Hope Spur. Has anybody heard of Hope Spur by chance? They've been, they were on the news, front of the newspaper uh, last week um, doing their ribbon cutting, and, and they did it right there at uh, City of Refuge. But they're a uh, nonprofit for mental health, and that is one of the biggest needs right now. Um, I, I shared a little bit of my past of losing my wife to suicide. An opportunity came up for me to work for a, a thing called the Georgia Crisis and Access Line. I do that at nighttime. Um, I'm on call from 6.30 at night till 6.30 in the morning when I'm on shift. Uh, but we actually go to calls of individuals that are either suicidal, homicidal, mental health, a drug overdose. Uh, we cover all the way from Floyd County to Dade County. Um, we have a large zone and so almost like I tell people we're like the ambulance for mental health we, we jump up throw your pants on and out the door you go we actually go to their location if they're at their job on the side of the road in jail at the hospital uh, we meet them right there we assess them get them hospitalized if need be if not we leave with a referral in place and try to get them services um, but the partnership with the uh, hope spur the lady that's doing that is also my boss on my nighttime job. So it kind of was really bizarre situation, but that's what she does. She's a licensed professional counselor and she has a heart for community as well. And so she started a nonprofit to provide services for those who cannot afford mental health services. It's called Hope Spur. Um, if you'd like to meet them or see them or come down there and um, I can introduce you to her and, and uh, she can explain to you a little more about what she does and how her services work. But I think it's a great partnership because a lot of the ladies that come through, as I told you, they've been in ugly situations. They're able to um, uh, plug in with her as well and start the counseling services that way too. So other agencies like that would come on board. It's almost, we'd love to be like a one-stop shop for individuals that really had needs. That'd be a, an ideal vision, but it's kind of hard to make it all come together. But God can make anything happen. Amen. So just pray that doors would open up and partnerships would come about. That's That would be the biggest one. Absolutely. Well, can we pray for you? Absolutely. Would you feel comfortable with us gathering? You could just sit down and we'll Absolutely. gather around you yes. here and uh, we'll have prayer for I you. I do have deodorant on. And I'm just <laughs> God Almighty, I just thank you that you brought Brian to us today um, to share about his life and his work with the City of Refuge. Father, I'm just so thankful that that your grace reached out to help Brian to, to know that he's a person that, that you love and a person that is, has a purpose, a purpose that, um, and that, that he's someone that that, that you could use to, to be our true blessing to so many others, but most of all, that, he, that he's your child and that you love him. Father, we're, we're glad that Brian is here in our community. Thank you for bringing him to us, a man who, who hears your call and, and is obedient, who's learned to be obedient. Father, we're also thankful for the City of Refuge and 
the, the great work that, that they are doing to help people in need in our community in a variety of different ways. Father, there's a lot to be done there. There's a, there's a great vision that you've given to the people that work at City Refuge. And it, it can seem overwhelming that there's so much of a need and there's so much of a vision, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we pray, Father, that you'll, you will support City of Refuge, that you will help them to have the manpower that they need for this tremendous task that they have to, to work on. We pray that they will be supported with the finances they need to do the ministry you call them to do. Raise up generous donors and, and uh, both large and small within our community to help fund the work at City of Refuge. We pray also, Lord, for increased staffing at City of Refuge. According to the time, your timeline and your wisdom to do the work that's needed there. We pray that, that the leaders there at City of Refuge will, will see the need and the timing and will, will creatively think about how they can staff City of Refuge to do all that needs to be done. We pray also, Lord, that for the volunteers that, need, that are needed there to do such a tremendous work. Lord, lay it on the hearts of the people here at Pleasant Grove and at Grove Level and at LifeGate and at churches all around this community to be a part of what City Refuge does. And we pray, Father, that you will bring Christians throughout this community together in collaboration, yes. that we would move beyond our little clans and tribes and, and seek to, to listen for your vision for our community to work together on these great things that are bigger than anything that we can do on our own. We pray, Lord, that through uh, the City of Refuge and other groups in this community, we can all work together so that your kingdom can be experienced right here on earth more and more as we faithfully serve. So thank you again for City of Refuge and for Brian, and we pray your blessings and your help upon him that uh, he would be uh, full of energy and health to do the work you call him to do. And we thank you and we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Brian, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.